So we continue today from John chapter 4 verse 43. So now we have a healing of an official son. Okay, after the two days, which two days we do not know, that is the, the two days where Jesus was preaching to the Samaritans, that probably refers to the two days. So Jesus had spent two days of retreat in this uh, town of Sychar, no, with the Samaritans, and they had a wonderful time. And so after this, Jesus departed to Galilee. So Jesus himself testified that a prophet has no honor in his own country. So when he came to Galilee, the Galileans welcomed him, having seen all that he had done in Jerusalem at the feast, for they too had gone to the feast. So here it's uh, a little different from what we see in the synoptics. So in the synoptics also in Matthew and Luke, we have this proverb that was used to be mentioned at the time of Jesus that a prophet has no honor uh, in his own hometown. He has honor everywhere else. So this is a proverb which was very common in the time of Jesus and uh, it is used here by Jesus himself. But in this case, you see, uh, he comes to Galilee and the Galileans welcomed him. So they have seen his work in Jerusalem, how he uh, spoke in the temple so boldly, how he drew out the money changers. And uh, all this has made a big impression on them. And so they welcomed Jesus into their midst. So he came again to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When Jesus had heard, when he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went and begged him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Now, I want you to take cognizance of this fact that this man who is mentioned here, the official, was like a petty king. He was in Herod's court as an official in a very powerful position. And this man travels 20 miles to come and meet the simple carpenter. You see, he must have really swallowed his pride to come and meet Jesus. You see, he had a very high position in society. And Jesus, after all, was a carpenter. And of course, he was a new uh, rabbi who was coming up. But uh, for him to come down to Jesus so far and uh, coming with so much of faith is something so unusual. But yet we see this faith and uh, Jesus is going to reward this faith. But see what Jesus says. Jesus therefore said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Now, remember he's saying this at Cana of Galilee where he changed water into wine. And probably Jesus is saying this uh, to the people around, you know, you're all looking only for signs and wonders in order to believe, but it's not necessary. We just need to believe in me and then you will see signs. That is how Jesus would always say. But uh, there is also another meaning in this. You see, when Jesus talks to the Syrophoenician woman, you know, who was an outsider, you know, he kind of says, you know, uh, we don't throw the food that is given to children to the house dogs. You know, he seems to be very rough with this lady when he talks to her. Similarly here, when he's talking to this official, he says, you know, unless you see signs and wonders, you won't believe. Seems to be a little hard on this man. But Jesus would always test these people and uh, he knew that if this was really a genuine case. You know, they will not just walk away, but continue to put their trust in him. That is what the Syrophoenician woman did. And that is what we see this man also doing. The official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. You see, the man is very insistent. He is persistent. He does not go away when Jesus says something. He knows. You know, that's the kind of faith he has. He knows that Jesus has the power to heal. 
and that is why he has taken this long journey to travel 20 miles to meet the simple carpenter because he knows here is someone who has the power to heal. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke and went his way. Wonderful, no? See, he does not see. Uh, he can't see from a distance what has happened to his son. But to go back those 20 miles in faith at the word of Jesus is something extraordinary. The man believed the word Jesus spoke to him and he goes. You know, very often we want God to do things right here, right now. And uh, when God says, no, I, I will do it. You know, we don't, uh, we're not very sure. Sometimes we try to question, we try to rationalize. But here is this man who just believed and went. And as he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was living. So he asked them the hour when he began to mend and they said to him, yesterday at the seventh hour, that means at one o'clock in the afternoon, the fever left him. The father knew that that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And see, as a consequence, what happens? And he himself believed and all his household. Wonderful, no? So, one more thing. I want you to note that this man is now a believer and not him alone, his whole family. And you can imagine what must have happened to him in the court of Herod. They must have mocked him, made fun of him, and probably some of them thought he's a little mad, you know, to have faith in this person called Jesus. And yet, this man doesn't worry about all that. He has experienced something. That is what is so beautiful, you see. You have experienced God and nothing can shake you when you have this experience of God. So no matter what people say, no matter what people think, all that doesn't matter once you have experienced the Master. And this man has seen it, he has experienced it, and he knows that he is following the truth. And not only him, the entire family turns to God and believes. And they are rewarded for their faith. And uh, they are not afraid of anything. That's the clear sign of a Christian. You see, that's how a Christian behaves. You know, when he experiences God, he leaves everything else. He is not worried about anything else. What matters to him is that, you know, God is on my side. And God is for me. And that faith keeps him going. And that is what happens to this man. He now becomes a believer. See, he took out that took that first step of going to Jesus. That itself was a wonderful thing. It was a great grace for him to go after Jesus. And having experienced his power, he now becomes a complete believer along with his family. You know, he's not alone. The entire family is now transformed. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he had come down, come from Judea to Galilee. Right. Now we come to chapter 5, where again we have a miracle and then a discourse of Jesus. Another very important and beautiful chapter. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. You see, he's going again to Jerusalem now. So, now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool in Hebrew called Bedzata, which has five porticos. So here we have the sheep gate. Now the sheep gate is a place where there was a lot of water and all the sheep that were sacrificed in the temple for the Passover, they were all washed here. Okay, so this is the sheep gate where all the sheep used to be washed. And so in this place, which is called Betzata, well, the name, uh, there are two possibilities they say. One is Bethesda or Betzata. So Bethesda is house of mercy, whereas Betzata means house of loaves, house of bread. Okay, so here, uh, in this place, there are five porticos, John says. In fact, uh, this pool was excavated 
and uh, they found that uh, this was in trapezoidal form and uh, it was 315 feet by 220 feet with a central partition. So five porticos and there were staircases going underground to a drainage and plus there were some intermittent springs. OK. In these lay a multitude of invalids, blind, lame, paralyzed. One man was there who had been ill for 38 years. And Jesus saw him and knew that he had been lying there a long time. He said to him, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is troubled. And while I'm going, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your pallet and walk. And at once the man was healed and he took up his pallet and walked. Now that day was the Sabbath. OK, so now we have this bubbling of the waters and there is an intermittent spring and people attributed them to spiritual powers. So here we find a man who had been lying there for 38 years. And again, this is very symbolic of the 38 years. The Jews traveled through the desert. 40 years, no, 38 years actually. They traveled through the desert. And here is this man who has been ill for 38 years. And we have the porticos. You see the five porticos. Now when you look at it, uh, this becomes a symbol of Israel where the five porticos represent the first five books of the Bible, the Torah, and uh, it is the law. Now the law is unable to save or to heal people. The law is there but the people are still sick. The people are still ill and helpless. And they have gone through the desert 38 years of travel. And uh, here comes Jesus and he asks this question. Do you want to be healed? You know, you can see that Jesus knew that he had been lying there a long time. Jesus had this wonderful gift of knowledge he knew what was in this person. He knew what was wrong and he yet asked him this question. Do you want to be healed? You see. Very often we wonder, you know, what a question this is. How can you go to a sick person and ask, do you want to be healed? The person will say, of course I want to be healed. But you know, psychologists tell us that this is not true. That many of us, when we even when we go to a doctor, uh, we really don't want to be healed. That is what they say. Why? Because somehow this illness or sickness helps me to feel a lot of self pity, number one, and also number two, to grab other people's attention, that all their attention is drawn towards me. And so when I continue to remain sick, you know, I get a lot of attention. And so I really don't want to be healed. And so here I am telling the whole world that I'm sick, that I'm, you know, I'm in need of help and everybody feels sad. Everybody is kind of looking towards me and trying to help me and I get a nice feeling about it, but yet it's not a good feeling. You know, being sick means you really feel uh, ill at ease. You feel uneasy. You feel bad about it. And yet there is a part of me which says continue to remain sick. That's what psychologists say. And so Jesus asks a very pertinent question. Do you want to be healed? And here is the man who doesn't say yes. He only gives an excuse. You see. He says, you know, there is a belief that when somebody goes into the water, when it is troubled, you know, that person can get healed. But then what to do? I've never had a chance or an opportunity. While I'm planning to go, somebody else goes before me. 38 years, never got a chance in 38 years. I don't know. And this is man. This man, that's what he says. He says 38 years. I've been trying to enter into this water. Nobody is able to help me, nor am I able to access this part of the water when it is troubled. So. Jesus 
has empathy, he has compassion, and he looks at the man, and Jesus heals him. One minute, the man is healed, and Jesus asks him to take up his pallet and walk. Now they say that this is also a symbol of baptism. These waters that are troubled, you know, this bubbling water is also a symbol of baptism. And it seems in ancient uh, manuscripts, we find that, you know, when they had this uh, picture of baptism, they had a pool and a man carrying a pallet and coming out to the water. So this was something very significant. And uh, here we see this man who is healed, not saying one word of thanks to Jesus. He does not even find out who Jesus is. He does not ask for a miracle. Jesus takes the initiative. And the man who is cured just doesn't bother. He doesn't say thanks. He doesn't know who Jesus is, doesn't want to find out. He just walks away. You see, so the Jews said to the man, because it was a Sabbath, who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your pallet. Just imagine this sentence is mind blowing because here is a man who has been lying there 38 years. And today when Jesus comes there, he heals him in no time. And he is walking. Instead of seeing that miracle and praising God, this, the Jews only can see that he is working on the Sabbath. He is doing what he is not supposed to do on the Sabbath. Well, they have forgotten about the miracle. They have forgotten about the problem that this man had. So the man who was healed, he answers the Jews. The man who healed me said to me, Take up your pallet and walk. They asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your pallet and walk? Now the man who had been healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn and there was a crowd in the place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you are well. Sin no more, let nothing worse befall you. The man went away and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had healed him. And this was why the Jews persecuted Jesus because he did this on the Sabbath. See? The reward that this man gives Jesus for healing him is, is that he reports Jesus to the Jews. And that is why John says they began persecuting him because he broke the Sabbath. You see the attitude of this man. You see? He does not ask anything to Jesus. He does not really want to be healed. He's just wanting to remain there. And when Jesus heals him also, he doesn't thank him and doesn't bother. And when he knows who Jesus is now, he only reports him to the Jews. That's all. That's the reward he gives Jesus. You see? But you see, Jesus says, very unusually here, he says, Sin no more that nothing worse befall you. Now there are two things here. One is not that Jesus uh, uh, doesn't believe in this uh, ancient understanding of the Jews that any illness that someone had was associated with sin. Now, Jesus does not believe in that because the Jews, they always believed that somebody is ill or sick because of their sin. That is why we remember no, in the story of the paralytic, Jesus tells that man, my son, your sins are forgiven. So that was the Jewish understanding that any illness that I have is associated with my sin. And so Jesus tells him, you know, sin no more, but that nothing worse befall you. No, here in this case, apart from this understanding of the Jews, there is also this fact that probably Jesus knew that this man had done something wrong. And that is why Jesus says that nothing worse befall you. See, now you're already paralyzed. Probably this man had done some serious sin. And Jesus says, don't continue to sin because something worse may happen. So here we see a man 
who has had a sinful past but jesus heals him forgives him and he gives him this kind of uh, warning don't sin again don't sin any more and this man will be free he will not sin again he will not continue and uh, you know that is the power in the word of jesus when you know when he tells that woman also who was caught in adultery when he tells her you know go sin no more uh, she will become a new person similarly here also this man will become a new person but what we see is this man he is a little strange because he doesn't seem to be grateful he doesn't seem to really care only thing is he just wants to walk away after being healed and he just reports jesus and he doesn't care that jesus is going to be persecuted so this whole uh, miracle that we have the focus here or rather the main point in this whole chapter is the sabbath violation jesus violates the sabbath now if you remember when the 10 commandments were given it was only said that you know the sabbath shall be a day of rest and a day for the lord this was the original commandment but over the centuries the jews the rabbis and the priests had added bylaws after bylaws and in the time of jesus already there were 633 laws and there were so many regulations human regulations regarding what a person should do should not do on a sabbath and here petty things like you know carrying a mat and walking so many furlongs all this meant you were breaking the sabbath you see they did not understand the spirit of the law they just held on to the letter and the letter most of it was human regulation not god's law and they clung to it and they forgot they missed the whole point they do not see the miracle they do not see the power of jesus at work but rather they see jesus asking someone to do something that is not lawful on the sabbath that is why jesus is going to be persecuted john says this was why the jews persecuted jesus because he did this on the sabbath but see how jesus answered jesus answered them my father is working still and i am working that was why the jews sought all the more to kill him because he not only broke the sabbath but also called god as father making himself equal to god but you see jesus doesn't mention here that he is equal to god he only says my father is working and i am working and he will continue to say that he is completely given all this power because of the father now notice one thing god's work of creation never stops god does not go on vacation god does not have a sabbath are children not born on the sabbath you see every day every moment god is working and god is working and god is creating and god is fashioning and molding everything in creation every single day so there is no rest and there is no sabbath and so jesus says if my father in heaven is working he is always there on a sabbath he doesn't stop working and therefore i too cannot stop working on the sabbath very logical no very beautiful so the father is constantly at work you see no hospitals don't uh, close and say no children cannot be born today no even on a sabbath uh, children are born jewish children are born and so god doesn't stop in fact you know there is a nice uh, verse which i read somewhere says god never goes on vacation you see there is no vac- vacation there is no vacation for god god never goes on vacation he is always at work god never goes to sleep god never has timings you see god doesn't have working hours 
God doesn't have waking hours or sleeping hours. No, he's constantly at work. That is why Jesus says, I am also working. Just as the father is working, I am also working. But the Jews don't understand this. See, and that is why the Jews sought all the more to kill him because he broke the Sabbath and addressed God as father, making himself equal to God. Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only sees what the sees only what he sees the father doing. So whatever he does, that the son does likewise. So Jesus says, I am just imitating the father and I am only doing what the father wants me to do because I can't do anything on my own. I can't do anything on my own. It's the father who gives me that power to do it. And so I look at the father and I imitate him and he gives me the power for the father loves the son and shows him all that he himself is doing and greater works than these will he show him that you may marvel. For as the father raises the dead and gives him life, so also the son gives life to those whom he will. So you have seen only simple miracles now. You're going to see greater miracles, greater marvels. And uh, you will see the son of man raising the dead to life. And all this comes from the father because it is the father who works through me. You see, the father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the son that all may honor the son even as they honor the father. He who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Therefore, Jesus wants everyone to believe that he is the son sent by the father. Yes, he has all the power. Why? Because he is totally obedient and submissive to the father. And it is the father who gives him all this power. He says, I can do nothing on my own. It is the father who works through me, who gives me this power. And therefore, everything belongs to the father. And uh, by honoring me, you're also honoring the father and vice versa. Therefore, it is so important that we see that Jesus is a true reflection of who the father is. And he is sent by the father. That is what John wants to reiterate in every chapter of his gospel. That Jesus is the son sent by the father to save the world, not to condemn, but to save. That's why he uses the word judgment so often. God will not come to judge, but only to save. At the same time, he who does not believe will be judged because he has refused to believe. Truly I say to you, he who hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. See? Truly I say to you, the hour is coming, the final hour, no? And now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. and has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel as this, at this, for the hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So the son has all the power and when his hour comes, the son will give life to those who are dead. And uh, those who are those who are on the side of the wrong, those who have done evil will experience the judgment of God. And so he says, the father has given this authority to the son and yet he continues by saying, I can do nothing on my own authority. As I hear, I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I bear witness to myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness to me and I know that the testimony 
which he bears to me is true. So you see, he says, I am not the one to testify for myself. No, God is testifying to me. The father testifies to me and therefore it is true. Now he says he talks about a human uh, witness. He's talking about John the Baptist now. He says, you sent to John, you sent people to John, you know, so you sent Pharisees and scribes to John and he has borne witness to the truth. Now that the testimony which I receive is from man, not that the testimony which I receive is from man, but I say this, that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp and you are willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony which I have is greater than that of John. For the works which the Father has granted me to accomplish, these very works which I am doing, bear me witness that the Father has sent me. Okay, so there are two things here. There is the human witness, the person of John the Baptist, who bore witness to the truth. And Jesus says you rejoiced in him for a while. But there is a greater testimony here, the Father himself, who is working through me. And how is it that you do not see that the Father is working through me? Because the Father is constantly testifying to me. I cannot do anything on my own. So the very fact that I'm doing all this means that the Father is doing it through me. So that is the greatest testimony that you need. And that is the testimony you have. It's not a human testimony, but a divine testimony. So all this bears witness to me that I am the one sent by the Father. And the Father who sent me has himself bore witness to me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen. And you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe him whom he has sent. You see, so Jesus says, you cannot see God, he is formless, he is a spirit. And his word does not abide in you. Why? Because you're not willing to believe me. Because I am the one sent by the Father. So when you refuse to believe me, you also refuse to believe the Father, your creator. And he goes on to say, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. Because for them the word of God, the Torah was everything. And they say that, you know, if someone has understood the Torah, they will discover God, they will experience God. He says, the scriptures which you are searching, they bear witness to me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. You see, so I, I am the word of God himself. I am the word itself who has taken flesh and come and yet you refuse to believe me. And if you come to me, you will experience life, but you don't want to. I do not receive glory from men, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. You see how strongly Jesus attacks them. Very, very strong words from Jesus. Very openly and blatantly he's saying, you do not have the love of God within you. See, I have come in my father's name and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you will receive. How can you believe who receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do you do not think that I shall accuse you to the father? It is Moses who accuses you on whom you have set your hope. If you believed Moses, you would believe me for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Very strong words from Jesus. He says the Torah was given to you that through the reading of the scripture and understanding it and imbibing it, you will really become followers of this one true God. But I can see that you don't really believe in God. And therefore, I will not pass any judgment on you. It is Moses himself who is going to accuse you. Because 
you do not believe me because moses wrote about me jesus says see whatever moses wrote is now fulfilled in me i am the fulfillment of the scriptures and yet you do not accept me see how john is so strongly uh, you know attacking the jews you see john we know wrote this gospel at a time when the christians were being persecuted by the jews they were being excommunicated they were being tortured and john knows that there was a growing animosity and these jews just refused to accept jesus and that is why he is writing so blatantly and he says you know you have no love of god within you because if you really had that love of god within you you would have accepted me but you are so filled with hatred so filled with falsehood that you are you are not anywhere near god you are not willing to accept god yes on the outside you call yourself jews you call yourself a chosen people to say that you are the ones you know who know the true god all that is in word but not in deed because in your heart you do not believe because if you really believed you would have accepted me you see how strongly john comes to this point because he is now talking about the truth because it is not what a person says it is what a person does and what a person is convinced of looking at these jews you know you can see you know john is able to see that they reject jesus and by rejecting jesus they are rejecting the true god who sent jesus to save them so if they cannot accept jesus that means they do not really believe in god and they do not love god this is a very clear sign for john and so that is why he kind of puts it into the mouth of jesus where jesus is telling them you know you believe ordinary people who receive glory from one another but you refuse to believe the one whom god himself has sent you know god has set his seal on him god has given him all the authority he's given him power over life and death and yet you refuse to accept him and so how can you call yourself children of god see he comes very strongly upon them so this whole chapter 5 is all about sabbath violation we have seen sabbath violation in the other gospels we saw that in matthew no where jesus walking through the grain fields and breaking the sabbath all that we have seen in the synoptics but here very clear the sabbath violation how the father is constantly at work there is no sabbath for god and since there is no sabbath for god the son sent by the father also has no sabbath he is constantly at work and he does only good work and because your eyes are closed you refuse to believe because your eyes are not on the true god your eyes are on falsehood your eyes are on other things on worldly things that is why you are not able to recognize me you are not able to recognize god who is working through me and therefore moses becomes your accuser not me not my father but it is moses himself because you put all your trust in we have to understand this very clearly you see in our own lives externally if we go to church externally if we do all that is required of us but in our hearts we don't live a christian life jesus says you will stand before god in judgment and uh, it will be very sad for us on the last day if we have not really obeyed god if we have not really done what god wants us to do see so often we are stuck to the law we are stuck to the rubrics we are stuck to the externals but in our hearts we have no love of god we have no love of neighbor and uh, we do not really live a life that jesus wants us to live and today when we read about these jews we kind of tend to accuse them or look down upon them 
But this whole thing, this whole passage is written for us that we may look at ourselves as we look into a mirror, that we may be convicted, that we may be convinced of the truth, that we may turn to God and live. Today, God gives us that invitation to look into our true selves, to break away all the masks that we are wearing, to break away from all the externals that we are trying to do, trying to put on a show as it were, to show to the world that we are Christian, but what we are doing in our personal and private lives, only God knows. And God wants us to look into our true selves and ask ourselves today, am I living as a true disciple of Jesus? Or am I trying to cheat myself? You know, I may show to the world that I'm very good, but in my heart, I'm far from God. Today is a time of introspection where God invites us very gently. He says, do you love me? Do you love me more than anything else? Do you love me more than anyone else? If it is true, take up your cross and follow me. Do whatever I tell you. Obey my voice. Listen to the promptings of the Spirit and you will experience divine life. Amen.